Welcome to the ninth slideshow for Victory Garden. We're going to be looking at March of 2012 and going to talk a little bit about how this, I wouldn't say exemplifies because it's not the best demonstration of permaculture and agroecological techniques, but it does offer a great example of a resilient ecosystem. So let's start off and see if we can get through here. There's a lot of pictures this time. I took a lot of pictures in March, uh, and we're going to just dive right on in here as usual and hopefully get to 30 minutes. I've been clocking in about 40, so let's, let's punch for 30. Uh, first photo, it's a bee. Wow, wow, it's another bee. I like this picture. I like pictures of bees, especially when I manage to get them mostly in focus. Uh, the colors are nice. Spring is here. Spring is here, and why take photos of bees and flower heads? Uh, everyone, you know, people have done it before. Look at the top center. There's another insect going on in here. There's somebody else using this cabbage for forage. This is a resilient system. This isn't just bees. This is providing nectar for everybody. This is everyone coming here and get what you need because there wasn't a winter, you're waking up from hibernation early, you're coming out of your uh, out of the mulch, your overwintering sites, wherever they happen to be, and we have a buffet for you. This is very important. This is very important. Let's go to this next picture here. Uh, things are still low. The cover crops are not very tall yet. This is March 11th, so we're halfway through March, and you're going to see an explosion of growth, uh, an absolute explosion of growth in color over the coming pictures. I like this picture, not because it's very sharp, not because it's very detailed, uh, you're not, you, there's nothing that's really drawing your eye, but if you sit back from the screen for a second and look at the different patches, we have patches of green, these different lumps, these different types of vegetation. The vetch is different vegetation than the clovers. Uh, then the top right, you've got a patch of cabbages that's doing really well. And then you have leaves. There's some leaf mulch going on. There's uh, wood mulch. There's a diversity of ground covers in this picture, and I like that. Uh, we don't have a lot of vertical dimension going on here, unfortunately. And this is something that I'm talking about now because we're moving into the shrub era, if you will. Uh, probably the next year or so, we're going to be looking at the shrub species that we want to introduce, whether they're going to be pioneers or whether they're going to be something else. But we want some woody, short shrubs in order to break up this landscape even more. Next picture, this is just a daikon radish that's going to flower. Uh, I like taking pictures, I kind of call them uh, portraits of the plants as much as I can. And when they're sharp, I'll include them in here. I've got so many more pictures that I'm not putting into these slideshows, but I think this is a good one. This is a daikon radish as it's going to flower. Uh, you can see all the different stages of bud development, and you can see how it's bolting. Um, just a really cool plant. I love the texture of the leaves of the daikon radish. Here's some alfalfa. Alfalfa, as soon as the temperatures woke up a little bit, it was ready to go. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer, of course, so it's got that punch from nitrogen that's just going to allow it to grow vegetatively you know, by leaps and bounds, and you'll see it uh, get even larger over the course of these pictures. And then you look beyond the pretty flowers, and there really isn't too much going on. There's a lot of small, small flowers that are probably more specialist flowers from just the seed bank that's growing there on the southern facing berm. That's all going to be uh, sheet mulched and planted over with more desirable species because it's such a great location. But you can see the difference uh, between what our lawn, this is what our lawn would have looked like. That berm is what the lawn would normally look like in early spring. So if we had a warm winter, where were all the insects going to go for their nectar or anything? 
you know, there really isn't anything available for them. This picture, uh, this is one of those Hugh Culture Mounds, southwest facing. Uh, I forget how many garlic cloves I put into this and these other ones. I think the total count was 200, 250 cloves of garlic that I put out late in the winter. Uh, so they didn't get to grow over the fall. These would have been a lot larger if they had been able to. Uh, so we'll just wait till the next year. And next year, um, you know, they'll be a full size ready to harvest. And this is lacking a lot of diversity because it's a new bed. Remember this, uh, in the last couple slideshows, it was still dirt. There wasn't even any mulch covering it. So we're on our way to uh, production. Here's a close-up picture of a bunch of seedlings that are coming up in a blueberry mound. Uh, this is one of the blueberry mounds that had that relative of Vietnamese mint that we allowed to just flower and flower and flower last year because we didn't have anything else in bloom. And I believe these are seedlings of it. I'm 99.9% sure this is because uh, it was all over our garden. We had this same kind of teal colored seedlings popping up in, in mass and we, uh, we had to work on killing those because we didn't want as many of them growing as we had last year. But you wouldn't see that in these other parts of the garden like here. Even though this is getting a lot of shade, for the most part there's a thick vegetative cover which is preventing sunlight from reaching the soil which is good because it prevents seeds, unwanted seeds, from germinating. Uh, but it's also kind of bad because it doesn't allow the soil to warm up as much. However, we're in zone 7B. It doesn't get that cold. If you can't wait until uh, late March, you know, late April, probably late April is more a better idea, late April to plant out your tomatoes anyway, you know, you've got plenty of time to grow warm season crops. We don't need to worry about uh, pulling mulch back to warm anything up too much. Uh, one correction from the last slide show, in the bottom of this, all this that's in shade, I had said, doesn't get any shade. Apparently I was wrong. This is why, it, for me, I like taking pictures because I can go back through time and take a look at what did the garden really look like and not what I thought it looked like. Uh, if you're not taking pictures, keep a journal. Keep a journal, write all this down. Uh, you know, Once a week, go out there and write what was in shade from your buildings, what was in flower, what was in bloom. Um, it's probably best to even do both. Uh, something else you can see in this picture, running right along the center, well, not exact dead center, but a little bit lower than center, you can see a long line of mulch. That's the berm from the second swale, and all those bamboo stakes are where we've got comfrey that's going to be coming up uh, from this. We grew outside the fence, dug up cuttings, and you know, we put them along uh, the berm. Here are those Hugh culture mounds I was talking about, and they're doing pretty well. I like, I really like how I did those. I, you know, probably wish that they were further uh, to the south. Uh, but remember, we are going to be taking down these pines eventually, uh, and to make room for more productive species. So, you know, take it for what it is. Uh, for now, they're going to produce biomass regardless, and they're going to improve the soil. They're going to improve so many things for us that I could have done it another way, but this is how we did it. Um, I think it looks nice. I, I think it's uh, turning out pretty darn well. That was the first set of pictures. Uh, let's go to the next day, the 12th. In this bucket, I've got Black Eyed Susans that I dug up. I responded to a ad on Craigslist. I was going to bring even more from there, but the person who owned the house was screaming at me because I was taking too long, uh, you know, doing them a favor. But uh, regardless, we got quite a few Black Eyed Susans. And that, that's a native, wonderful nectary plant, beautiful plant. They do take tend to take over, but remember we're going to the forest garden. Black-eyed Susans don't grow in full shade. So let me tell you, bring in these full sun plants that are native if you can. You know, we have a lot of non-natives too, but we, we try to bring in a lot of native plants uh, because we know they're going to do well in our conditions and they're going to be beautiful. And eventually we can phase out the aggressive ones like this. Uh, old green guild just completely covered in white clover. Uh, the swale is dry right now, uh, not big, not a really a big deal at all. Um, but it's it's a healthy guild. We haven't done too much with this area because remember it gets a lot of shade in the summer, and we've been focusing on 
you know, all those annual vegetables that require a lot more sun. Uh, we've been focusing on plants that are sun loving as opposed to shade loving. So, you know, in the coming seasons, we're going to be looking at what can we plug into these guilds uh, that are going to thrive. You know, maybe the white clover wasn't such a good idea, but if you chop any plant back enough, it's going to, uh, you know, reduce its resiliency and you can get something else growing there. This will flush with color later. This picture won't quite as much. This is still mostly cover crop, but because it receives a lot of water from our neighbors, I like not having too much growing in there besides, you can see dandelions and the white clover, um, you know, and other dynamic accumulators are in here. I like having those because they're going to absorb some of the chemicals for us. We're not going to eat them. And uh, if we can bind them up in the soil up here before they get to the garden, the main garden area, that's all the better. Uh, common vetch up close. Here's another picture of it up close. Uh, beautiful flowers, really beautiful flowers. Uh, it, Like I said, it wasn't as hardy as we hoped it would be, but enough of it survived and went to seed that we should have some coming back up next year. And hopefully there'll be even more plant material that's left drying and you know, after it dies, left standing vertically so we can climb up there. We'll see just how big these uh, awesome little plants can get. Let's go to the 13th. I took a lot of pictures, like I said, of the same area. This this is a neat area of the garden. It's one of the largest beds in the old Nightshade Guild. Uh, there's a quite a little bit of a diversity in here. We've got uh, spotted mint, which is a relative of bee balm, uh, red clover, alfalfa, garlic, daikon radishes, um, I don't think there's any oregano. There's no oregano in this bed. We do have spinach and lettuce. There were some beets struggling. There are also some onions growing in here. Really diverse little bed. But remember, this area doesn't get a lot of sun. It looks like it, but it actually gets a lot of shade in the winter from the buildings. Here's running along the fence, which is mo really just a real thick, thick cutter crop. Uh, but you can see these overwintering sites. I put overwintering sites, left them. These are mostly basil plants that we just left standing because they got woody and they would stand up over the winter and be a great uh, place for insects to hibernate. Oregano. Oregano just continued to grow throughout the entire uh, winter. Really large mats, really thick. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure I saw a lot of spiders here. It looks like a good place for spiders. Uh, and we love spiders. I mean, spiders, sure, they bite everything. It's nature. You live in a real world. Uh, we got to learn how to deal with these kind of things. Um, looking north from the Green Guild all the way down to the garden, keep in mind how low a lot of these plants are. Look how uh, they're not very tall quite yet. Here's a bumblebee up close. Did manage to get another good picture of them. Um, they come out later than the honeybees. Uh, top center is some kind of, looks maybe like a weevil or something. So remember, you're not just after pollinators, you're after the entire insect community. You need a large insect community. Um, if we're looking at edible forest gardens and we go to uh, neighborhood assessment for beneficial habitat, uh, they've got a whole listing here on things to look for and how to... Um, you know, grade it either excellent, good, fair, or poor. Uh, we're doing pretty good in terms of food for our beneficial insects. We don't have a lot of specialist nectary plants available at this point in time, which is something we need to work on. Uh, but we do have a lot of in available nectar for all these emerging insects, and that is going to allow the predators to have lots of food because they need herbivores to eat, but they also need nectar for themselves. And then birds. Birds need to have a wide variety of insects as well. They eat, I mean, birds are a major uh, predator of insects. We've got a nice flush of color from the cabbage. I really like how the cabbages uh, put out so much nectar really early on for the entire insect community. Um, just taking advantage of the sun while they have it. This next set of pictures is anywhere from the 13th to the 20th. Here's a heavily cropped image of the water hyacinth in the upper pond 
And notice how some of it, bottom left center, is turning green once again. And then also top left center is another green. Uh, it's not mold. That's these water hyacinths regenerating as it warms up. I didn't know they would do that. And again, for anybody new to these slideshows, uh, we cut every single flower that these produce because even though they're beautiful, we can't afford to allow them to escape uh, because they're so invasive. Uh, but we don't have, we didn't have any other plants. We did, we hadn't found any nurseries that were selling native aquatic plants. Um, so we went with the water hyacinth, and it's done really well for us, producing biomass and uh, helping keep the goldfish fed and everything else. So, you know, it, it, it's all about management, really. It's about managing your plants and understanding them. They can't escape unless they seed. And if you don't let them seed, well, they're not going anywhere. Uh, another picture showing just how much light reaches those hue culture mounds. The kale looks pretty good. Um, you know, a lot of people grow things in cold frames over the winter, but we, we don't do any cold framing. Uh, if you remember the slideshow from November 2010, I did have a little bit of a cold frame going on, but I've abandoned that because I noticed that, you know, in our climate, uh, it's, it's sort of unnecessary if you have enough space like we do uh, to grow a large number of plants. You take a little bit from here and there. This is great. I love the little power lines between the garlic sprouts here of spider webs. These are spiders running webs all over the mulch. You'll notice that, especially on a really dewy morning, that it sort of glistens from all the spider webs. That's telling you that there's a lot of insects that are trying to burrow in the warm mulch overnight, and the spiders are, you know, setting up traps for them. Just another view of the garden, framed by the two pine trees. The willows looking so, so nice uh, from last year. It, it even looks like it's growing up straighter uh, than it had before. And by the end of these pictures, the amount of leaves that it's produced is just incredible. We've never seen it that healthy. Crimson clover, this is the first crimson clover bud. Um, crimson clover, you'll see in the next slideshow. You should see it in the April slideshow. And even into May, crimson clover is one of our favorites. It's so beautiful. Uh, speaking of breeding, here are our goldfish. I think they're starting to make their maybe third or fourth generation of goldfish uh, already in March. And, uh, well, already since last year when they were put in the pond. So, uh, you know, this is the first spawning of the season. I was afraid there wasn't enough room for the females to escape. There was nowhere for them to go to get away from the uh, aggressive males, so I captured both of the large, the largest ones I could see that were getting chased. You know, I just assume those are the females. Uh, and here's one of those, and I put her and the other one into the large pond so they would have a safe place to give birth. Here's a wide angle shot of the garden. You know, this is what a resilient landscape should look like in my opinion this is uh, you can tell we are in the process of restoring fertility and vitality to this landscape this is what's under our carry so we need to put you know show our ideals and what we believe in uh, with our landscape instead of expecting somebody else somewhere else to do habitat restoration we admit that what we were doing was the opposite of providing a healthy landscape uh, for the native animals and plants and everything. So we're working with non-natives to help restore this area of the um, and this little corner of the globe. I think it looks really nice. I think it's spe it speaks to your inner part that says this is restoration. You know, then on the other side of the temporary fence, this is what we're dealing with. I mean, we uh, can't really protect plants as well here. So what we're doing is trying to a, you know, overseed this lawn and uh, you know even allowing quote weeds to grow to outcompete with some of this grass underneath the plum there's crimson clover that's where the first bud of crimson clover was coming from uh, there's a sea of white clover underneath the right birch and then there's a wishbone shape of mulch and that's a really thick layer of mulch that's protecting this highly trafficked area from more damage because it was very 
um, yeah, it was it was scalped and there wasn't anything growing. So if we we put a a, a band aid a bandage over it, and so now the fungi are going to be able to bri in association with these uh, birch trees and the pine trees, they're going to be able to break down this uh, humus and allow other seeds and other plants to grow there eventually. Dandelion seeds wet from the morning dew. Comfrey, look how big this comfrey plant is. It's not spring, like this shouldn't be spring yet, they shouldn't be this big, but when you are using agroecological techniques uh, thinking along permaculture, like using that framework of earth care, um, you know, nature responds. And when you have a diversity of species, look at the, in the background, there's crimson clover running along the back. Then you can see garlic and mustard and everything else growing. When you have this number of species growing, you immediately are able to recognize nature's ability to respond to fluctuating climate. Yes, there are times when your climate and the weather changes so fast that nature can't keep up, but it has a better chance when it's diverse and it's supported uh, by the people who are living there. And that's what this landscape is demonstrating. I mean, look at this picture. You know, if this was just a lawn still, it would be dead and green. There wouldn't be anything available for insects. There'd be nothing. It would just be pretty much dead. I mean, the, in comparison to this, uh, you know, a manicured lawn is dead. Uh, look at the far corner, the back right corner. There's that ram's horn willow that's leafing out as well. And I love that tree. I really love that tree. Um, I really love all the trees that we have. Even the pine trees uh, do their thing. I really like. Uh, I really like everything that's growing on our property. I mean, look at. The growth here, there's even a cardinal uh, visiting one of our bird feeders right now. Um, <laughs> this brings a smile to my face to see that we, I didn't water, you know, there's no watering going on over the winter. We put the seed out and just did. We didn't cover any plants up. This is what can happen when you trust the natural instincts of these plants and you trust billions of years of evolution or you know God's master plan for creation whichever thing you believe you have to trust the rest of the world it's not out to get you this is out to help sustain us this is what a cover crop can look like you know this if we wanted to we could mow all this down at the end of April and then plant out a massive garden and we would have results we'd have better results in the first year Here's a birch tree that is leafing out. Here's that uh, blueberry that made a couple appearances in the last slideshow. Bumblebees are great pollinators of blueberries. They can get into those flowers. Um, healthy, really. Now, the form isn't that great. Remember, this was just a plant that was given to us. We didn't grow this from seed. We didn't uh, anything. So it is kind of a funky little form. It could probably use some pruning, um, but we'll let it go for a little while. And it's it's just, you can tell it's going to be loaded with blueberries. And again, we only water if we're giving it some compost tea. You know, these are fending for themselves and mini hugelkultur mounds. I say mini because we didn't use logs, I used branches, uh, pine branches at that. When you're talking about access to water for insects and birds, they need gentle slopes, not abrupt drops down into, uh, you know, into the abyss. They need to have a little bit of a bank. They need to have vegetation that's sticking down into the water uh, so that they can climb down there and get something to drink. Because we're not the only things that need water to drink. You know, birds, insects, mammals, everything needs water. Uh, so that's why these ponds are stepped. They're stepped down and they're sloped down nice and gently in some places, abruptly in others, uh, just for diversity. And you can tell that this is a place that's going to be supporting a lot of life. Look at the edge. Along, you know, center and then right is the garden and then the left that we're going to be sheep mulching. That's going to be covered in flowers in the next year. You know, it already is actually right now. Um, just 
this is regeneration on the home scale. That was the 13th to the 20th. Let's go to the 23rd. We're nearing the end. Uh, look at how much larger these plants are getting in the green guild. The comfrey is getting bigger. These comfrey in just two weeks ago, you could barely even see that these comfrey plants were even growing there, and they're already uh, showing their stuff. Um, if you look dead center, I've actually chopped down a lot of the white clover. I'm actually starting to chop and drop up here. I've chopped all this white clover down uh, in order to allow the lettuce and some of the mustards and everything to have less competition. And there's a flush of nitrogen in the soil, so now they've got a little bit of fertilizer uh, so they can maybe start to compete with the white clover a little bit. And remember, like I said, how short everything was. This is uh, the wheelbarrow turnaround of the old Nightshade Guild. That's a five gallon bucket. So these plants went from five inches tops to a couple feet high in a few weeks. This is cover cropping. This is a cilantro plant that's going to bolt up through our alfalfa and red clover. There's uh, garlic in here as well. Uh, that we're just letting there, you know, we have so much garlic that we don't need to pull everything up. Remember, you want to have a diversity of plants growing at all times. Like here, you got spinach, daikon radish, white clover, red clover, lettuce, common vetch, arugula, cilantro, mustard, cabbage, dandelions, probably nettle, dead nettles henbit, I would, I would imagine probably some chickweed. This is a polyculture going on, not as thick. Remember I said in the last slideshow we could have planted a little bit more densely, but remember all this really brown area was covered in vetch, but a lot of this vetch died back. And since it was, it was, it was a warm winter, but you still couldn't really germinate anything, uh, so we didn't put any seeds out in there. This is right across the pathway from there. Again, the health the health of this environment that we're just beginning to have a modicum of understanding. Uh, there's that large pond again. Looks good. I uh, can't wait until everything on the other side of the pond is covered in shrubs and um, you know coming to life as vibrantly as the cover cropped area of the garden is. This is vibrance. I really can't say too much more about it. Um, you know, those insects that were overwintering in these brush piles, that were in the bark of our birch trees, that were nestled underneath the mulch, that were uh, living in the old sunflower, you know, <laughs> the sunflower heads. They're coming, when they awaken, this is what they're expecting to see. Um, they're not expecting to see death and destruction. They wouldn't even be there, probably, not in his numbers. Um, we're fostering the population of beneficial organisms. And we're growing food at the same time. Here's garlic, here's more garlic. There's a ton of garlic in this picture. Not only on that mound, but in the foreground, uh, not the immediate foreground, it's more like the middle ground. If you look at the pine tree on the right, and then you go to the left at its base, there's another bed of garlic. And uh, there's a cardinal Cardinals have staked out this territory. They fight over our territory now, and this is only the second year. We don't even have a whole lot of food available for them year-round besides the feeder. Eventually, we don't want to have the feeder. We may have it, uh, but we won't fill it up as much because we'll have plants that are offering the food instead of having to buy it. Back end of some of those mounds. Remember, this is just subsoil covered in mulch now. We're we're trying to uh, rehabilitate it and uh, get it going. So one day when we cut down those pine trees, there's going to be uh, some really good growing beds here. This is one of the other blueberry mounds. And you've got garlic. You've got the blueberries. Cut. There's two blueberries. You can only see one. Comfrey, black-eyed Susan. Um, and there's lemon balm there in the center. So... There's still a lot of space here, but I know it's going to get dominated by tomatoes later on. This is a great tomato spot, so uh, right now it doesn't look like much. We, sh we will be filling in these niches. Remember, there's only a couple people doing stuff back here, so uh, these things take time. Allowing the crimson clover, 
dandelions, chickweed, dead nettle, henbit, uh, whatever we possibly could grow underneath the plum tree besides grass, we're just letting it go uh, full steam ahead uh, to accumulate biomass because remember trees are, most of them want fungal soils not bacterial soils. They can handle bacterial soils at a young age, the pioneer plants, but as they age they would much rather have access to uh, you know a thick layer of uh, humus rather than you know lawn grass. Okay, I think there might be one more set of pictures, oh, two more sets, but there's not too many here. Uh, second swale, full Here's uh, that really big comfrey plant taking advantage. Uh, really, this is what we like to see. You know, when we see that second swale full, uh, we know we're charging the groundwater of the garden. Look how tall and thick this is. Um, I'm going to come through and chop and drop after it flowers. We'll talk about that probably the April slideshow. Here, the second pond is full. Wonderful. Love seeing that. It's going to increase the temperature of the air around there. It's a heat sink. It's going to reflect light up onto the uh, southern facing berm. Um, you know, there's just a million things that ponds do. We could talk, maybe I could talk about those in some of the other slideshows. We're kind of running out of time here. Probably already over 30 minutes, but we'll see when I turn around the phone. Uh, again, abundance absorbing that wonderful spring sun and turning it into biomass and we haven't even reached really spring yet so uh, imagine what a forest garden can look like if this is your base that we're building our foundation now these are the last pictures uh, you've seen this guild quite a few times um, you know it's maturing these mustard plants these Zocco purple mustard plants, you'll see them the next couple slideshows. They got almost five feet tall when they bolted. That's how healthy they were. And this is how unhealthy, you know, the rest of America treats. Uh, we have a grass lawn too, but we're working on a nice plan to do a complete renovation at one time of it. Uh, we're going to be able to produce biomass from the backyard, bring it up front, and really uh, make it explode with, you know, beneficials and uh, we'd love to have pomegranates maybe some citrus figs uh, and just really show what is possible on a south facing aspect not just this grass lawn that doesn't feed anybody it you know it requires feed it requires you to dump stuff all over it uh, here's our dynamic accumulation going on in the upper part of the green gill, just letting the dandelions do their thing. We've got lemon balm, parsley, comfrey, uh, white clover, arugula. There's all sorts of stuff in here. We could even do more. Remember, this is the beginning of restoring balance to the system. Look at the willow. I said, look, remember to look at the willow at the end. That is a healthy looking willow tree. From It probably had a quarter you know, a quarter of that many leaves. Uh, I could actually, I'll, I'll be sure to insert a picture of it from April so you can see what it looked like in April of last year versus what it looks like now. I'll put that right in at the end of this one. Uh, give it about a couple seconds, but look at this. Just, this is restoration. This is organic. This is life. This is what humans can do with a little knowledge, quite a bit of effort, yeah, there's a lot of effort, but it's fun. You're reconnecting to the landscape and you're actually sequestering carbon, uh, producing food for yourself, feeding the environment. Um, this is what we need to be doing. Here's a close up of uh, dandelions. I was supposed to put that other picture in. I, I go through this, I make the narration, and then I sync up the pictures with it so I'm gonna give five seconds after this one so you can look at how small that willow tree is um, and you can think for yourself how much healthier our system has gotten in just one year okay and this is the last picture for the slideshow uh, you've seen this view quite a few times but 
you know, if you look just to the left where all this vegetation drops off, you know, think about the two systems. What, which one is going to be structuring soil? Which one's sequestering carbon? Which one is feeding everything? Uh, feeds the soul, it feeds the environment, feeds animals, plants, insects, birds, whatever. Whatever comes here is going to be revitalized. If you're in a dead grassy area, mm, not so much. And the willow oak, take a note that the willow oak on the far left is beginning to leaf out as well. So were the birch trees. The birch trees were too, but uh, I hope this was an enjoyable slideshow. It was fun to make and uh, hope, hopefully you'll stick around until June when we uh, complete the slideshow series. Thanks for